pumped. Dig Deep Podcast number nine. Mrs. K. Martin from Broco Gear. Let's do this. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to another edition of the Dig Deep Podcast. Today's recording at the world headquarters of one of my favorite brands ever, Broco Gear. Makers of all things technical headwear, performance gear. Super thrilled to be joined by Boko Gears founder, Kay Martin. Kay, thank you very much for being on the show. Oh, thanks a bunch, <laughs> Hugo. So fun. Yes, I'm pumped. I am super pumped. Um, we're gonna talk a lot, we're gonna talk about a lot of things today, all things entrepreneurship, um, how you started Boko Gear. Um, uh, but I was telling you this before that when I was doing my research, okay, so I I I, I Googled the words K Martin. And uh, the first thing that I found was this lady, uh, singer, uh, very voluptuous lady. Um, oh, that's so me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she actually was a singer who, who had an album called K. Martin Sings Naughty and Nice Song. So th that was not you? <laughs> or were you a singer in your, in your previous life? Um, sure. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. My kids would tell you that. My family. <laughs> From a big family, so they thought we were we thought we were the Brady Bunch growing up or the Partridge family. So yeah, I would say I have a, a singing background. Do yeah, you sing? Sure. You, you like singing? Heck, uh, by myself in the car. Yeah. yeah, it's so funny. And when I run, I get busted with someone coming up behind me, and I'm totally singing at the top of my lungs. It's so funny because uh, I just thought of my wife Amy. She has this beautiful voice. She never sings, but like once in a while. When she's like cooking or taking a shower, she just starts singing. And I always tell her, you should do that more often. So anyway, <laughs> she appreciates that. But all right. So wanted to um, ask you first, um, you, you lived in Colorado, in Boulder, I think, uh, for most of your life. Is that right? Or well, I grew up in Boston. Yeah. In, oh, okay. Uh, I thought we were, you were from Michigan. Yeah. No. What happened there? Oh, no, no, nothing. We're good. We're so good. I grew up in Boston and went to school in Michigan, hence my University of Michigan, yeah. you know, whatever, screensaver. Um, <laughs> I was one of six. We all went there. And then I moved back to Boston, started a company there uh, with a friend of mine that I graduated with. And we, were, we would get people in shape. But it was the early times of the 80s when a degree meant more than what you accomplished uh, <laughs> athletically. Let's yeah. just leave it there. So anyway, um, I met my husband actually on Ragbri. We were riding across Iowa and I met. Uh -huh. And he was working for Cannondale at the time. Okay. And Cannondale put people out on the uh, on the road in the early 90s. Okay. And he chose the Colorado Territory and I followed him out here after we got married. And um, so that's what started our Colorado journey. And I'm from a big family and we just said, oh, we'll only be out here two years. But you know right. how it is when you come to Colorado and you come to Boulder <laughs> and you meet people and you play and you have fun. Um, yeah. There's just no way I'm going to go back. So I do call both places home. I call yeah. Boston home. I need to go back to see the ocean. And yeah. uh, I love my family. So I head back there every year, uh, a few times a year. But you know, Colorado has been our home since 91. Right. And our kids grew up here, so we've been here for a long time. Awesome. That was when I was finishing high school. Yeah. Um, Boston. I've never been there. It's funny because I've never really thought about the Boston Marathon until, I don't know, maybe a couple of years ago when you start, you see your friends on social media going, doing, doing Boston, and you're like, well, because I never really, like, follow a specific program to try to qualify for for boston right. so it's like then the, that bug starts you know itching you're like <gasps> you know and then you know De desert island then wins this epic um uh, you know race recently so um but yeah i mean that's one of those places that i definitely need to go so when you guys moved to boulder and you were talking about you know you started a company because you you've been an entrepreneur pretty much since you you know it's just been part of who I am right. I think the whole time even right. when I worked for different companies Correct. was knew I would end up somewhere running my own company it yeah. was and then later in my career it was it was always one of those thoughts like you know what I don't know what it's going to look like and I don't know what it's going to be but um I would love to take a shot and run my own company again it's mm -hmm. it was more flexibility it's hard work mm -hmm. it it uh it's the good and the bad but I yeah. felt like I had um, come to a point in my career where, okay, you know what, I'm going to be, 
I'm a salesperson through and through. So yeah, I, I knew that you're as a salesperson, you're only going to be at that company for as long as the person that hired you is there. Yeah. And in this kind of climate right now, you know, presidents come and go and, you know, that happens and then so does the salesperson. And I just felt like, oh God, I'm going to be on another roller coaster. So, yeah. um, and sorry, I'm a swear, but the last time I was fired <laughs> for growing someone's business, um, I really was able to reflect and say like, okay, I'm an old person now. Like if I haven't got it by now, this is the time that I should think about starting my own company. Yeah. Um, and I had gotten a job with, um, friends of mine, love them dearly. It's the people at Belega. Huh? And the way I, I, uh, started working there, I had been telling my father like, okay, dad, like, here's the deal. Um, I am looking for, I'm going to find that company that's going to hire me in a sales capacity or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, and my working name for that is MNA, NMA, no more assholes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had really perfected working for people that treated people like shit. <sighs> and, um, and I, I, I had some really, really unbelievable mentors through my career, mm. but I also had some huge ogres that are in, you know, keep getting jobs in the industry and they're doing really well. And I just felt like, God, there's got to be a place for someone that treats people well. Yep. And um, so for me, I targeted Belega because I was like, if you've ever met the people that started Belega, they're the nicest people in the whole wide yep. world. And Bert and Tanya, a benefit is they're from South Africa. So mm -hmm. if they fired me, it would sound like, hello, okay, but you did an awesome <laughs> job. And they can I say words it. like fantastic and things that Americans can't get away with. And I thought, oh, if I get fired from them, how cool. I'll come home like skipping and jumping because, yeah, yeah. you know, like, oh, I'll just feel good about myself. So anyway, I went to work for them. And when I was there, people kept reaching out to me because – the job I had prior was working yeah. at a headwear company mm -hmm. and people were reaching out saying, come on, can you just make headwear? We don't want to work for this asshole. We don't want well, to. So, whatever, I mean, that's blah, one blah, question blah. that I have. Uh, and you know, I was going to ask you later on, but it, I thought it was interesting that you started vocal gear after, because I, I, I thought, okay, you, you're leaving Belega, a sock company. Yep. And then I don't know, normally people start to leave their own companies after you know working for another company in the same industry but i mean of course you, you you work in the previous company before but i thought it was interesting that between you know working for a headwear company and starting your own, your own headwear company you work uh for for balegas not necessarily in that very same category right right so, right. so okay yeah and um, makes sense that you're saying that people were reaching out to they, you Yeah, so I think it was a stop along the way, right? So it was they're reaching out and they're saying like, hey, I really want to do it. And when I looked at the category at the time, so, you know, four and five years ago, it was super stale and dated. There was maybe yeah. one company that was doing anything, any business. But when you looked at that company, Goo and Timex and everybody had the same white hat with a logo front and center in the middle. Right. And it was an old man dad hat. It was totally seen its yep. time. It was... I remember. Yep. Mesh. It, it it saturated. Because remember, I've got a background working for Pearl Zumi Moving Comfort. Mm -hmm. I came from product and I was always taught at a high level of product snobbery, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, no, I'm just but... not going to make crap. So I knew... Uh, deep down that there was uh, a place for a higher end performance headwear company of some sort or a uh, product for sure that was just moving this category forward. And it's amazing to me when I started um, mm. because uh, at, at my previous headwear company, it was the biggest complaint we had like, oh, your elastic stretches out and it's too tight and oh my God, don't you have any new products? Right. So we just started working, um, you know, I started fiddling with people I knew in the industry. That was the benefit of being around for so long is mm -hmm. I had known so many people and what's, uh, Who started to try to, was that a result of, I mean, not only your personality because you're really, I mean, people person, I mean, love hanging out with you, but also because of your background in sales. Probably. Okay. And, and I would just call contacts and, you know, um, I don't know if you're the same, but now certainly since I've been in this position, mm -hmm. I always do. But if someone reaches out to me and wants help, I'll be like, yeah, fine. I'll go to coffee. I'll help you. Yeah. I'll do. And it's just the way that, uh, that 
when I look at my career, if I can help someone, absolutely, I will. Side note right there, because that's how I met you. Um, right. So for, for our listeners, that's how I met Kay. When I first moved to Boulder, I just sent her an email <laughs> out of the blue, the same way I did with Franco Batterot, um, my guest in podcast number, I can't remember. But I just wanted to network with you. I, I you know, became aware of Boko Gear, and I just wanted to meet you, and you were kind enough you didn't know me at all we met for coffee and i think that we've been in touch since then so sorry thank you that was awesome yeah (laughs) um but that's the way this industry is they're small it's small and when you get to know people um if you have a issue or a problem there are people that will definitely help you along the way and i think the hardest part is asking right yeah so you're too proud you're too whatever uh you know it all and uh, I became a really, really good listener. I had always been a product snob, but I think at that time when I started, I ca- became a really, really good listener, listening to the market, listening to what's happening, listening to feedback. Yeah. Um, and uh, at a certain point, uh, the first product we made was the elastic back visor that you can print. I knew it was an issue. I knew it would be a slam dunk. With Boco? Yeah, with okay. anything. Okay, so got it. So in the past, uh, elastic back visors looked like underwear. And all yes. you guys yeah. would run around with underwear on your head. All us girls would sit back and say, there is no, that is the ugliest thing to have. <laughs> That's true. Whatever listed nine times on the back of your head looking like Calvin Klein underwear. Oh my gosh. So that was the standard and every triathlete was so proud and I'm like, that just looks awful. I'm sorry. It yeah. just looks awful. So we developed an elastic that one wouldn't stretch out, that secondly wouldn't be too tight and that we could sublimate. Because when you looked at a sublimate advisor, right. the only thing you could do was sublimate the front. Yeah. And then the back was listed with whoever's name on it was seven times. Right. So if you're a brand, you don't want somebody else's brand on there eight yeah. times, right? I agree. Looking like yeah. underwear. Yeah. So uh, I would say the minute we came out with that visor, uh, we were in business and we were in big business. I had called a friend of mine who had left uh, a headwear company and she had retired to take care of her kids. And I had said, remember saying to her, Kim, um, I'm just going to use you for like five hours. Like <laughs> maybe like five. I don't know. Just draw, you know, do some stuff with yeah. me. And the same with my production person. I had, she was working then at a, uh, I think for a dentist. Uh-huh. And we were like the dream team because we had worked together. We yeah. trusted each other. They were both in Ohio. I was here. And I just said, oh, come on. It's going to be like two or three hours a week. It couldn't be much. <laughs> and I would tell you within a month, they, we were begging them to quit their jobs, find babysitters, get on oh, this. Awesome. This is going to turn into something. So that was super fun. It's funny. I always thought that your first product was the trucker hat. Right. Because that's another question that I want to right. I want to talk more about. Um, you know, Ironman uh, Kona 2013. Um, I remember seeing Luke McKenzie finishing second wearing this, you know, trucker <laughs> hat. And it's funny because... That was not your hat, right? That nope. was an auto nope. auto hat. It was just there. a bad yeah. auto cap that was. Yeah, it's so funny about that hat because I um, that was actually my first hat that I launched with Dig Deep. Um, it, it, I knew that the quality was not good, right. super cheap, but for some reason the fit. I've been a trucker hat fanatic forever, and I was just curious about it, and um. But anyway, going back to Luke McKenzie, okay, the guy wins, right. no, finishes second, yep. wearing this really bright um, right. hat, and I'm, I'm curious when that happened, like, I'm sure that you, you, you thought, what, what, what were your thoughts? Did you see opportunity right there? What what happened after that for, well, for you? Well, it's interesting because, you know, back up a little bit, um, so, you know, Luke definitely put that on the map on the Iron Man scene for sure, at least mm-hmm. in, in the public eye, yep. right? Yeah. But we had been making them. So I was approached by another pro, the uh, the Wordles. They had come to me and said, like, well, Heather doesn't wear a hat, but Trevor does. Oh, wow. And okay. Trevor had reached out to me and was like, hey, Kay, I'm wearing your I'm wearing your hat and it's falling apart. And I'm a brand new entrepreneur. Like, what? Like, yeah. what? Really? Talking and, about care, caring. Uh, that, what a concept. I was like, <laughs> you know what I mean? I like, was just devastated. I was like, what do you mean it's falling apart? And uh, I said, and what? And I knew I had made him like just a cotton trucker and a visor. And I said, your visor's falling apart because we had never heard that. And we had, you know, mm-hmm. these out on hundreds of thousands of people or whatever. And uh, he said, no, your trucker hat. And I'm like, well, 
Trevor, what are you doing with it? Because I thought it was just a podium hat. <laughs> and he said, well, I'm running and training and racing in it. And I'm like, oh, dear God, no. Like, this yeah. thing's made of cotton. Cotton equals rotten, right? Like, it's not going to be performance at all. Yeah. So he really, uh, and then he and a bunch of people around Boulder, um, and then friends that I knew that ran, we ended up just developing a trucker hat made out of performance materials and then dialed in the fit because our fit is so different and people were running through aid stations. We were learning as we were going. So, you know, leading up to Luke, um, Luke McKenzie, I mean, people were doing Ironmans and truckers, but they were the cool kids, right? It was coming from surf and skate. It was coming from California. Oh. It was a trend that we could see coming through and, um, you know, we were, uh, really because I was going to ask, um, Before Luke, I used to wear just, you know, uh, a visor. That's yep, all. That and, was it. And, and then I was just wondering if trucker hats were popular in the trail and ultra running scene. I don't know how much, I mean, you know, because I. They I were. Know. Yeah. Okay. okay. They were. Got it. But it wasn't mainstream. It yeah, was still so true. like, yeah. oh God, here are my options if I'm young. Yeah. An old man hat yeah. that's mesh <laughs> that looks nasty. A visor, which is cool, but I'm shaving my head now and I'm kind of bald, yeah. right? So I'm going to burn. <laughs> so they started wearing whatever, the auto caps, their cotton yeah. hats, their whatever. And we were seeing them in uh, in Ultra. You'll see them with the cool cat kids on in triathlon. But it just, the momentum that it gained overnight with, uh, with us making them technical was nutty. And we were ahead of it. We, we, uh, we registered and trademarked technical trucker we yeah put a whole bunch of um you know ours are actually not made at some massive factory that produces them at whatever size and just slaps a, a headband on the inside like most of them for us we dialed in the fit so if you're yeah. uh, an athlete and you're running through an aid station right they were they were taking them off they were scooping water up yeah. they're throwing ice in the top of them um and then people would come back and say hey my um my sunglasses are flying off when I'm running through the aid station. I really don't have that problem because I walk through the aid station, but whatever, <laughs> right, I, I'm like, a good listener. Like all of us. You know, we get back to that. <laughs> and so um, we we shortened up the depth in that so that you can wear your sunglasses. You can take your hat off and I on see. and you're not going to flip your sunglasses off. So, um, And so it's funny that you t we're talking about the hotels, uh, Trevor and Heather. I, 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 One question I had for you was like the very first, you know, days, months of bulk of year, who were your first customers? Okay. My first customers were like the Boulder Boulder because I had had relationships with them forever. Mm -hmm. And I was super cautious um, because uh, we just had some stuff going on where people were after me personally and the company uh, let's just leave it at that like mm -hmm. lawsuit and blah 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 so we were just trying to avoid any conflicts so I waited and had people reach out to us and what typically happened mm. was um, you know it's a small industry and I'm in Boulder and um, people would find out through friends of friends like oh Kay's making some stuff she could yeah. do something for you and I did that for a good year because I just didn't want to cause any waves and it was just better to stay low but what that created just by itself was this you know totally organic underworld grassroots you have to be super hip and I'm laughing like oh my gosh it's totally working in our favor that we're not out making a huge website, beating the ground. You have to know someone to yeah. know that I'm making I mean, hats and visors. When I was telling my customers that I was going to make a next round of hats, this new hat, several of them were like, are you going to make a Boko Gear hat? Are you going to make a Boko <laughs> Gear hat? Because they <laughs> they were not very happy with the auto mm -hmm. hat fit. The fit, it was, I mean, of course the quality, right? But yep. it was the fit too. Like uh, there's people, it's funny. I, I thought it was... I read an interview that you did or a podcast where you talk about people with uh, small heads. How do you call them? Uh, people with cat heads. Yeah, your cat head your or cat pinhead. Pinhead, yeah. So, um, uh, gosh, I just forgot where I was. Oh, so that's, that was going to be my next question. It's like, how did, you know, how were the first like six months up to a year? So, okay, focus on, on growth and. Like, right. Okay. Right. So, um, the, the first six months, uh, you know, I was kind of, 
when I really first started, I was still doing Belega, so it was part time. Mm-hmm. So I was working with Belega, and they graciously allowed me to do some stuff on the side with Boko. And I would say at the end of that year, it was more the come to Jesus, like, wow, I'm doing as much business with one as I'm doing with the other. That's it awesome. just kind of snowballed. Mm. Um, and at the time, we were working with some big events um, already, just from people knowing who we are and what we could do. And like I said to you, when people started seeing the visor could be printed and everything else was yes. not, that really got our foot in the door. But as these pros, so many of the pros, you know, they're not sponsored with headwear and yep. they all want to kind of wear something cool. And the yep. trucker hat was rambling down. Then they'd reach out and like this cat head thing. I can tell you everybody that has a fat head and I can tell you everybody that has a cat head, <laughs> right? It's just, we made to order and we got, we got a lot of feedback from people that really beat these things up for a long time, mm-hmm. way more than a traditional athlete would do that. Um, but what I loved was every, Every hat we made, um, we said early on, we'll never duplicate a, um, we'll never ever duplicate a style, um, a design. Mm -hmm. And that was a big win for us because you don't want to be Cliff Bar and goo is running around with your hat. Yeah. It frustrated the whole industry prior and it's lazy. Yeah. And so if you're a, a custom designer and you're doing, you know, uh, templates, that's fine. That's just not going to be Boko gear. Well, I'll tell you the two things that made the most impact on me when I was shopping around for, to make my, my, my hats with my previous brand, Boulder Training Mecca. Yep. That when I learned about, well, well, did I, no, I was actually, even before I met you was a couple of things. One is like, wow, can I really make my own design (laughs) and and print it on several parts? Like, (laughs) on the you know the bell under it um can i have my you know uh embroidered on the back and the other thing that was huge for me as any small you know uh entrepreneurs the the, the amount i remember that my first order was like 25 hats. right right when we started. I, I, I didn't need to because i remember all the companies would ask you for 200 right or, i was like no i mean well here here this was good and bad right so um the good is yeah. that we were trying to be uh, trying to be good, good like stewards of what's happening in custom. Right. And when if you look back, the options were you had to buy two hundred. So for you, Hugo, you'd be so mad at me because three years later you'd still have a hundred left to get Correct. through. It was no different for a team club. It was no different for a, um, for a retailer. And I had been in the industry so long. We were like, we have got to find someone that'll make smaller minimums, turn them faster, because the average turn time was 180 <laughs> days by yeah. sea. That's crazy. You know, you could fly it in for an extra dollar for 60, um, and it frustrated everyone. Right. So when we came at it, it wasn't only we wanted the greatest product. We wanted to change the uh, paradigm, and we wanted to say, listen, you don't have to go to a, a dumb, dumb print shop and slap a logo on a cotton trucker and have no customization. We want this to look like you. Right. We want your company to look like you. We want the next company. And we were less interested in branding uh, Boco than we were you. Right. And it's not, I'm not bullshitting you. I, I honestly uh, believe that the way custom works is if it's you guys first and then us, right? Yeah. Like we'll put a logo on the side, we'll put a logo on the inside yeah. or whatever, but we're not going to put seven on it. Yeah. We're not going to brand ridiculously. And if you know what, there'll be times when our designers will say, you know what, let's just drop it from the outside or put it in the back yeah. in a small tab because it'll make the hat look better. Right. So there, there's enough flexibility with us that I feel like, we're trying to do the right thing for the brand, right. the brand that we work with, the event that we work with, the retailer. So the small minimums, that was the first time that's ever been done with yes. full custom. Yeah. That was, a, I mean, that was huge for me because mm-hmm. I remember thinking, okay, I can start working with a company that um, is flexible enough, you know, on that aspect and also makes <laughs> cool products. So uh, before we move forward, we, we keep talking about, um, you know, later on um or you know boco in in the next years like i'm just curious about when you were starting it when you were like thinking okay i'm gonna start boco gear I'm curious what were your expectations and fears like oh what's my god your mind? So what's my in your mind well when you first start right it's uh you're standing over a clip 
cliff and you're le- <laughs> leaping off. And I guess the saving grace is I, uh, I was, I knew that I could get a job, another job, right? I knew that I could get a sales job. Yep. Um, it, I don't know, it, it might have required a move or whatever, but it, the worst comes to worst, I always sat back like, the worst comes to worst is this doesn't work out and you get another job. Correct. Right. But it, but I kept, what kept pounding at me like was if I don't do it now, I'll never do it and right. I'll kick myself. Oh yeah. But I would tell you that if I, I wasn't ready 10 years ago to do it, I wasn't hungry enough. I wasn't, I usually say vindictive and Irish enough to start something. But, um, I, uh, I, I was so much more I was just in a better position to say like let's take the risk now yeah right it wasn't a great time for my family at all yeah, I mean I was petrified I mean, uh, we you know you're um we were scraping by or yep. whatever and I have two kids entering college I mean it wasn't the brightest move I made but um and I would say that first year was the hardest struggle yeah. but it's interesting um I I, I would credit uh, a lot of people for really getting behind it. I mean, we had early customers that would call and say like, yeah, okay, it's like, I love them. They're great. They just weren't perfect, right? And yeah, I'm yeah. so picky. I'm like, oh my God, they're not perfect. But they just wanted to support you. Like tri-bike transport was awesome, yeah, right, Mark? Yeah. And, you know, he could have said like, hey, if you know him, he would say like, okay, I know the logo's upside down on half of them, but so what people can wear them upside down yeah. like he would say that right yeah. that's just the type of guy he yeah. is so there were people like that that come thick or thin they were going to support me and and help me get better that's because of their relationships oh yeah with yeah them. and and right. and you know uh Kristen from betty i mean there were just people that reached out and were like oh my gosh i've seen what you're doing and that's awesome. i love it yeah. and Uh, I want to help you get better. So we had good feedback and we didn't have to fall very hard is what I said. You know, you know, um, my guilt kept us going, but (laughs) I would say that there were a lot of people that, that reached out that supported us. It's funny. Um, you're talking about, you know, how you decided to start for me, it was like, all of a sudden I had like an awakening because I always thought that I was going to pursue, you know, a career in corporate. When I met you, I was I I was I think working for for you know a, a CPG company. You know, yeah. C- and um, but one day I just had this kind of you know awakening with that. I just I realized, you know, I'm gonna be 80 years old and I'm gonna <laughs> regret not at least giving it my best. And um, so yeah, that was kind of big. I think another reason that kind of got me you know motivated to start was. Um, you were talking about mentors. It's right. interesting because when I was working for big companies, I always wished that I, I, I never really found people who could really help me to build a solid career in corporate. And, and, um, but now I, I have my own, what I call virtual mentors is people that I follow on social media, which is entrepreneurs, people who, mm-hmm. um, you know, successful people. And one of them is this guy, Gary Vaynerchuk. Anyway, this entrepreneur, and uh, he always talks about working hard. Uh, no bullshit, okay? No, right. you're going to, you know, I don't know. He's like, you just have to work hard and be patient. All the right things. And yeah. um, he really, he not only me, I have a lot of friends from business school who, um, it's funny because 99% of them are still working for companies and, and, and that's great. But a few of us are like having this awakening. like, mm-hmm. oh my God, you know, I, I can, you know, maybe do something different because I always knew that I was not going to be the CEO of Nestle or because that that was kind of the original goal when I left Peru. It was like, I'm going to go get my MBA and I'm going to be the CEO of one of these companies. And, you know, working as a brand manager with other hundred brand managers with you, I don't know, for some reason I thought this was not going to happen. And the other thing was I just, I felt that this passion that I have for things in general was not necessarily translated into the things that I was doing. So I was like, okay, I'm average here, but, uh, it's interesting, you know, how, you know, how we all, um, I guess the motivations, right. That, that you have, and you're right. Like, um, you talk about studying 
your business in not necessarily the, the most ideal conditions. The same here. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting if I look at, you know, my career, I had some great mentors, right. And, mm. uh, reached out to them certainly when I was starting this business and, um, and always have kind of kept them in my back pocket and, um, and, and, and it was kind of right time, right place, I guess. Uh, I also am super competitive, so it didn't hurt that, um, that I was a competitor, yeah. right? That I was, uh, but I also was a team sports competitor. So yeah. I grew up playing team sports. So I knew how to play well in a sandbox. And, um, but I just felt like if I work 24 hours a day for the next two years, whatever. And I do remember when it finally clicked, uh, I don't know, could have been when Iron Man handed me the big fat PO, but I just remember sitting back and saying like, oh gosh, we're going to be, I'm going to be just fine. This team is going to be just fine. That's awesome. <laughs> and um, I, I just felt like we had the winning formula. We had yeah. great people and what we were doing, I felt was different and uh, it was different enough and yeah. I'm not going to be comfortable. And even now the, one of the guys that, is certainly has been a mentor like for a bunch of my career and he's my one board member mm -hmm. and uh he said the other day now like you know you're doing great and still growing whatever but don't get comfortable right yeah. and there are those there are those comments that come from people they can be just someone that walks by someone that looks at your business and they'll stick with you for a long time and right. one of those was a guy a few years ago and he said uh be flexible because yeah. I would ask people like, okay, you know, how did you make it? Same as you, you know? Yeah. And he said, you've got to be flexible because if you're not, I would be thinking, oh, my company's going to be this hat company and I'm going to make exactly what everybody else had. Right. But I listened and I, I, I would say I am no doubt I know more about headwear than every competitor that we have. I, I know more about their headwear. I know more yeah. about what sells through for us. I, um, I study it. I have a team of people that study it and um and we're not afraid to take a risk yeah and we have enough of a following now that we can ask ambassadors we can ask event yeah. people and they feel like they're part of the program and that was a beautiful thing because you yeah. got to a point where you said wow we can actually put something out and i don't care if you tell me it sucks like yeah. I, I i actually don't i'm like okay I'll move on. Yeah. But, yeah, right. I mean, um, yeah, you just you, you But try. I'm not going to say like, no, it's the best thing ever. It's like, yeah, you're right. It does suck. Like, and you I never know if it will work out or not. Like I, I have a, a cool anecdote. When my wife, um, when Amy started, she started uh, her own business with her best friend and it was in the craft beer category. So it was not a beer business, beer brand. It was like they would make T-shirts and glassware, things that, you know, they were pretty common, you know, up people would usually buy right t-shirts bottle openers and they were doing okay but it was not until they created this product it was like a shadow box beer cap collector um it's just basically this shadow box they drill the hole on top mm. and um beer geeks would uh, always collect their beer bottle caps and they didn't know where to put them they would always put them in ziploc bags it was yeah until they came up with this thing that when they first created that product, they didn't think it was going to be it. It ended up being like 85% well, of, of the company's revenue. Uh, when they first created the product, they would go, well, they, me too, would go to Michael's, buy a bunch of shadow boxes, would go back home, would drill a hole on top, and that's how we would sell them. But it, it got to a point where we ended up finding um, a partner or a vendor in China like because we needed to make these a wow. bigger, bigger scale um so yeah i mean you don't know what is going to you know be the the product uh so um so yeah we often laugh because you know if we'd make a lot of trucker hats and we have seven or eight different models of them now and yeah I think it's always funny when someone calls and one, they want to come to headquarters and you're sitting in it, right? It's my house. <laughs> um, so another barrier we broke was having a virtual company. And I do remember people saying, well, I don't know how long that's going to last. Cause we had five or 10 people and, um, you know, we have close to 30 people and they were all virtual. That's awesome. Um, and part of that is how do you motivate them? How do we stay yeah. motivated? And, um, I'm not sure, but with the way this business works, it's cogs in a wheel. So we can clearly tell if someone's 
out. But yeah. for the most part, we'll slack and say, hey, I'm going to a, a basketball game and we're going to my kids, whatever. So they'll be out. But people just jump in for each other. It's a really, uh, it's just a unique company that I, I don't know how that happened. But Yeah, it's funny. It's they said that one question I was going to ask you is, to, I was curious to learn about your your leadership philosophy. How will you describe it? I mean, um, <laughs> such a deep question. I think if you right? ask me versus <laughs> ask other people. Um, I don't know. I, uh, I, I still take a, a really big part of the sales process because I love that. So I think my philosophy is don't do crap you don't like to do that you're not good at, right? right. Yep. So I definitely surrounded myself with people that are great at what they do and they're th things I don't like to do. So if you ask my team, they're oh like, oh, God, I, I do that. this because yeah. Kay doesn't like to do that, right? Or Steve doesn't mm -hmm. like to do that. And uh, there was another side of it that when we started, the two women I hired were uh, stay-at-home moms, right? Mm -hmm. so, or, or, you know, now one of them's, you know, breadwinner or whatever. But um, I... I look back at my career and uh, I brought my kids to work. I, I gave up a lot of what they did by trying to make it in a, a very male dominated, right. you know, outdoor industry. And I worked really hard, but potentially, potentially sacrificed more than I should have for, mm -hmm. uh, than, than wanted to for my kids. And um, so my, what we ended up with at Boco were people that, that maybe couldn't work nine to five. Mm -hmm. So they have kids they have to pick up or yeah. they're taking care of somebody or they just don't want to work nine to five. So it's really interesting the to lead a company that is like, I'm not going to browbeat you if you're going to your kid's game. Right. If you want to go take a run and so we can tolerate you for the afternoon, <laughs> uh, you better do that, right? right. right. Um And we try and say that we're just hiring people that want to do a good job for the company, that care about what they do. And there is no leadership at that point. Mm -hmm. It's like they own a piece of that business. All the salespeople own what yep. they do. Yep. All the production people own that. And it's a big team rowing, hopefully, in the same direction. Right, right. But if you were to say to me uh, three years ago, who's the laziest in the company with everybody that's virtual, all of us would have told you who that person was. Yeah. So it's not, it wasn't hard. It's just that we were all, we're trying to protect, uh, um, we're trying to protect a culture that we all want to work at. Yeah. And if there's bad behavior, because we can be bitchy, yeah. like we we all can. Yeah, of course. There'll be a little slack, like, ooh, you know. And <laughs> we have a couple women that will put up memes that make us all laugh and kind of get <laughs> us all back to I love where we need to be. But yeah. um, I'm hopeful that we're kind. Yeah. I mean, that's my new thing is like, okay, this year, we just let's be kind. Inside, outside. Right. You know, treat people the way you want to be treated. That's, yeah, I like it. I mean, talking about culture, that's, that's important. And also focusing on your strengths. That for, That's one of the things that I've shifted, like, in my mindset, I guess. I used to think, okay, I need to be good at everything. And then um, I just decided that I'm just going to focus more on the things that I'm good at and, you know, m my strengths and the things that I'm not that good at, I'm going to have other people work on. Like, for instance, Amy, she's great on all things finance in in operations mm -hmm. so she she does that like right. i don't want to deal with not that i cannot w create a pnl or you know or, or things like that but i just i think that um if i focus on my strengths um you know i can definitely be more productive more effective and this is again one learning from this guy uh gary vaynerchuk which is interesting because now in this era of social media and access to technology gosh you can just go to youtube and I don't know, learn so many things about, like, for instance, I've been following Tim Ferriss. He has a podcast yeah. too. And, and I always watch his, his videos and, um, and I also follow all the people do, that are not necessarily like, like Tim Ferriss, who's all about mindset and things like that. But like how to, br how to grow up your newsletter, how to grow your newsletter, how to create a, a great, um, video blog or how to start a podcast. Right. <laughs> I had no idea. Like when I decided to start, I, there's so much information out there. But um, but something that I was curious about is um, okay now you you know you started Boko five years ago um, 
I'm, I'm curious about like how the, the process of growing sales for a company because I I imagine that you know you first started or you still do of course um, selling your products for brands right it was more like a B2B yeah, so we'll type of approach yep and my question was gonna be like what other like sales or distribution channels have you adopted since then to grow the business because I found you on Amazon for instance so for instance I'm curious what do you think of Amazon or, or any other or like I'm sure you've done a lot of expos you know or like I'm curious about what what other distribution right. channels are you have helped you to take Boco to the next level well it's interesting because Boco is not a wholesale a traditional wholesale brand right so we don't build a lot of products and keep it in a big warehouse and then sell it to stores and mm. beg and hope that they come. And part of that was uh, absolutely part of the philosophy at the beginning. So okay. I had been involved in wholesale business my whole career. So Pearl Zumi, Moving Comfort, whatever. Yep. They all were uh, brands that brought product into a warehouse, took preseason orders and sold them. And the climate's changed, right? So for me, when we looked at it, we said, let's come at this like a source, right? We're going to be the factory and we're going to be a source to all these people that can't source it on their own, right? right? So you can go, um, you can call us and we'll make you, you know, 35 hats or bags mm -hmm. that, but for us, we have no inventory. So you, after this podcast can walk in my basement and see the well, there's, there might be 20 boxes down there yeah. of yeah. stuff, but, um, that's only because we were forced after we got more popular to bring in product. Yeah. And our goal was very similar than what we train our, our, the people that buy from us, buy what you need, not what you think you may need, because just like you, Hugo, you'll buy 35 hats, but the next time you're like, oh, that was really great, but I want to make a green one for whatever. So what we were trying to teach people out there, whether you're a retailer or an event or club, is change it up, make it different, yeah. give people a reason to buy. Right. Um, so everybody else is the person that's selling, or they can sell on Amazon, they can do whatever they want. And uh, for us, we, we didn't feel the pressure to empty a warehouse. Yeah. We didn't feel the pressure to bring product in and have an if come is what I call it. So yeah. you know, a lot of big mistakes uh, for young companies are inventory. And even old companies, right? Yeah. It's, it's what was the demise for half the companies that, yeah, that I worked with is you're stuck on old inventory and you got to work to get rid of that. Yeah. Well, when you don't have inventory, you're lean and mean and can turn and you're flexible. And, right. uh, oh, so what? I can't make the, that guy 10 hats, but you know what? Um, on occasion we'll bring in, you know, blank hats. It's just not who we are. Yeah. So we're not a promo company that brings in blanks because I also think that a heat transfer or a spot sublimation just looks terrible. Yeah. It looks, it's dated, it's old, yeah. it's junky. Um, it doesn't tell a brand story. So yeah. for you, you can get uh, an off the shelf black hat and you can put your logo on it, but that's what everybody else has. Right. That's true. Right. So yeah. it's like, I want people to go by you and say, Oh my God, I love that dig deep hat. And yeah. <laughs> I love that. That's true. You know, and, uh, they're not going to talk about you if you buy a white off the shelf hat and throw your logo on it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You post it on social media, you're going to get like three likes. It's your mother, it's your father. <laughs> and it, it's and the person you. that works for you, you know, <laughs> like you, be creative. The and times are changing, right? The last thing on earth I want is inventory. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that because, um, like, in the, so my business has been around for a year and four months. So, and I've never really bought tons of inventory, but, um, and, and a part of it's because Amy is always telling me just focus on what, you know, just yeah. very basic test, try and learn from that. And one of the things that I've been doing lately is, um, like asking my, my, my my clients and my hardcore followers like for feedback because one of the things that i've been trying to focus on as an entrepreneur business owner whatever is to try to grow that community i i read an article uh, i don't know if you read it it's called how to get a thousand fans um one time and it's this idea of focusing on um rather than thinking for instance you're on social media and you want to get i don't know ten thousand followers mm -hmm. and you do all kinds of 
Facebook ads and rather than focusing on trying to get thousands of people to follow your website or focus on the people who are already like focus on getting a thousand true fans. And the idea behind that is that if you find those people and then you cultivate, you know, a relationship with them, they're going to buy anything from, you know, sure. it doesn't matter what, what, what is it that you launch. So, so that's one of the things that I've used to help me focus on building this community, engaging more with followers and, um, that's been really helpful. And actually I've been using them, uh, to get feedback on what to launch next. I'll give you an, an example. So when I launched dig deep, okay, I had this logo. I personally liked it a lot. And, um, then I, I started working with Tony, the boom, you know, yeah. he, he, he leads my, my designs. I, oh. I love his style. And I asked Tony, okay, you know, innovation. Okay. We need to come up with new designs. And he created a bunch of things. And, then I went to my, my, you know, my followers, my customers, and I asked them, what do you want? And hundred percent of them were like, we want more stuff with your logo. And, and that was kind of a big eye opening for me because that was when I real I, I realized back then that I had not done a lot with my logo. Yeah. Like I just, I launched, you know, my, my hats with patches, but I didn't do t-shirts with the logo. I didn't do, I don't know, water bottles, whatever. And so that was a big eye opener because like people were like, we want to see more stuff with the Dig Deep logo. And so that's kind of where we're going next. Like um, Tony's creating like a vintage version of the logo. So it looks pretty rad. And um, and I want to do more hats in, you know, kind of third quarter. So we, we need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it, this idea of of having your, your followers, your fans, especially the people who buy everything from you um, to help you or to guide you to know what you should be launching because again you know being super small you just don't have the money right and that that's when i for instance i see all these other brands that i see in the in the triathlon category that uh, you go to a website and they like offer so many items that in my mind i'm like you're definitely not printing all this you're making on you know, one one exactly right so now there's more, I guess that's another question. These days there's more flexibility to print or do on, on demand or be more. That's why you have all these companies that print all these different thousand different types of triathlon suits. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. That, that, that definitely makes sense. Um, so, wow. It's been almost, this is fun. Okay. But you know, 10 more, 10 more minutes. <laughs> I, I, I want to let you work. Um, just a few, few, few final questions. Um, talking about digging deep. Oh my God. As an entrepreneur, any, 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 you know, we all have really hard moments uh, or experiences, but any, any particular one that you can think of, you know, in, in this journey of building vocal gear? Oh, I, you know what? There's, it's a roller coaster. I think always, right. Whether it's you or the business and, um, it's trying, you know, we, for us, we've got, um, we have growth pain points. We had cry sessions, you know, we, yep. we, we aren't always good at adding people when we need to, so we don't want to break them and, uh, the people that are with us, but, um, yeah, for sure. We, we've had, um, I, I think you just got to expect them and kind of do the, as much planning as you can mm. to get through them. But, but um, you do, you do. Like we've got Chinese New Year shuts us down for six weeks, kills us yes. for eight weeks, and it's our busiest season. Like really, huh? Yeah. So I... um, we've learned to get around a little bit of that, trying to get ahead of it. But at the end of the day, it, it's it's awful. We're just yeah. getting through it now. We're so busy. Yeah. And um, that's just always a challenge. Right. Um, our factory, luckily, is uh, our own. So he's they they produce only for us. And, uh, it's a challenge. It's a, it's a challenge. Uh, really? Oh yeah. That is awesome. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, we have other factories too, but the mm -hmm. one, the main one where we keep a lot of the kind of top secret stuff, anything new, anything worry, that's man. out there. <laughs> Um, we keep it at this factory and I call him my brother from another mother, but yeah. we fight like cats and dogs, like when <laughs> yeah. we have to, yeah. and you know, he's just very stubborn. So am I. And you know, at the end of the day, I don't love that, but, um, it's kind of a cultural thing, I think, um, just going back and forth. Um, but at the end of the day we're we, 
we both depend on each other's success. Yeah. Um, we both uh, really are um, successful because of each other. It's interesting that you mentioned, like, I was just thinking about when I was just telling you that um, with this beer business and then we ended up placing an order in China. We found a vendor in China, but through a broker, right? So, yep, sure. And that was really helpful. But even with the help of a broker who helped us find a really reliable company, it was so challenging. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think that the language maybe was a barrier. I mean, we were really diligent at, like, putting together documents and information of dimensions, colors, um, materials, things like that. And I remember the first run, uh, we had a lot of scrap, like a big percentage of scrap. And then you, know, you, you learn from that, you know, until we, we hit a point where, okay, we felt good about, you know, the final product. But, um, yeah, that's, that's definitely. Well, I mean, yeah, you can get on websites and you can find factories in China and the there's millions out there. But I think uh, if you're willing to take that risk with your product, go for it. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll hear it all the time. Um, and what we typically find, even from really big brands that have great sourcing, they go to China, they get a broker, they get a really good sample. They <laughs> always get a really good sample. Yeah. And then they put their units in, 1,000 or 600, and they come out like crap. And for... The 30 cent, 50 cent, I don't care what difference. Mm. They got to suffer now through something that makes their brand look like crap. Yeah. So it just hasn't been worth it. So the people that have been around for a while, like we're not going to get burned by that anymore. Right. right? right. You, you're, you're not going to find a great factory uh, unless you're super lucky through Alibaba. You're just not. You're just not yeah. going to find somebody that they're not going to broker you off. And God forbid you ever need a reorder. Because then you go to the reorder, and once you sign off on that sample, it goes to the lowest bidder. So yeah. they're out farming that out for the lowest bidder. Yeah. Um, that's not where I want my product. Yeah. So coming from us, it's going to be the same factory. Right. It's going to be, you know, the same fit. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's and, important. And I, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't want to take that risk with my brand. Right. So I know this question can be a little hard to answer, but just curious, do you have any, any idea of how do you envision vocal gear in the next five, 10 years? Like, I don't know, like any new categories that get, that get you excited or. Yeah. I mean, we, we, uh, I think if you ever ask me, um, <laughs> just based on my past, it, I'm not doing sizes. So. I don't oh, care who no. you are. If you have ever asked me a question before is like any category that has five sizes, men's and women's, we're not going to play there. Yeah. You know, um, we also do a lot of business with people that make, uh, kits and make t-shirts and do all that. And mm -hmm. God love you all. Right. Like it's just not my scene and the bottom's falling out there. There's so many competitors in it. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot in headwear too, but, um, but we took a, we took a road along the headwear scene that is quality yep. over pricing and we're never going to win the pricing game. People tend to not try and nickel and dime us with pricing because we're, there are options out there if you want a cheap hat. I yeah. mean, we talked about it. You can go yeah. to AutoCap. They're two ninety nine. Have at it. I don't <laughs> want my brand on it. Yeah. But, um, but not being complacent is a really good lesson. Yeah. That's all I'll say is like, there are some really fun categories that don't have sizes. Well, you know, I don't consider one or two yeah. a, a problem, but um, there are some really fun categories that people have been helping us with to expand into. And um, I think you'll continue to see that. Yeah. I think we'll, we'll continue to um, offer products that are premium that, that teams can use clubs can use that the retailers can sell and, um, and that, don't involve 12 sizes and a lot of yeah leftovers. yeah i know I, that's why i spend a lot of time doing the t-shirt thing uh, or asking people about t-shirts and but i hear you like I, I don't think that's necessarily like a sustainable category for me as well like inventory you know sizes. Oh, well, uh. <laughs> in our company you put five of us women in a room you can't is it going to be american apparel i mean you, you yeah. can't even get to what t-shirt <laughs> you want because We've got an age gap from 20s to 50s, yeah. and yeah, then true. you've got body types. I'm like, yeah. I don't want to be in that business. Yeah. And I was in that business for a long time. It's like, uh-uh. Nope. My arms are long. Nope. Nope. Uh, nope. 
Okay, before we end this conversation, I want to ask you a question that I heard this the other day. And I asked actually to my previous um, guest um, in the podcast. This is a very silly question, but it's kind of funny. Like, what thing are you super obsessed about right now? And I'm not talking about business related. It can be as simple as a song, a food or something. <laughs> Anything that you're obsessed <laughs> about right now. That I'm obsessed about right now. Um, I'm still in this question from Gary V. Interchuck. So Gary V., if you ever listen <laughs> to this podcast, <laughs> I'm always obsessed about chocolate. But yeah. I, um, I'm obsessed about. Um, yeah, I'm a. I, I'm a. I'm a obsessed about. Um, some new product right now. Ooh, that's yep. exciting. That's awesome. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. It's always, always a pleasure, you know. Yeah. Super fun. Catching up, coming here. Um, for our listeners, we invite you to follow Boko Gear on Instagram is at Boko Gear. And of course, you can always go to the website is bocogear.com. <laughs> Thanks again, Kay. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate your time. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.